Dr. John Bruni has arrived, complete with notes, I see. <laughs> of course, Jeremy, of course. <laughs> You're well? I'm very well, thank you, yes. It's good to see you again. Likewise. Uh, the last time I think we had any time together was when uh, you were doing that seminar on the submarine purchase, you remember? Oh, yes, yes, back in 2015 we did do that and we uh, we were lucky enough to actually Shanghai you, pardon the pun, uh, with regard to uh, doing some stuff for us at the, at the, at the conference. Yeah, I sort well. of uh, introduced people or emceed it or whatever the expression yeah, is. Yeah. But there were some amazing people there, Japanese yeah. admirals yeah. and uh, German, uh, I, don't, I can't remember how many people were in uniform, but uh, you got uh, some incredibly... Uh, senior people. We did. Um, and it was all in the lead up to that thing called the competitive evaluation process, uh, which came before the actual decision of the submarines, because as your listeners will be aware, um, there were three boats in contention to replace the Collins class submarines. Yeah, it was the Japanese? Japanese, the French, and the Germans. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, the, the good money at the time was that the Germans would just be a lay down misere because mm. they dominate the conventional boat market. Uh, many of the countries in the Indo-Pacific that can't afford nuclear-powered submarines go German. Um, but, you know, there was a unique opportunity in and among that mix that you will be well aware of, and I'm sure your listeners remember it as well. You know, then Prime Minister Tony Abbott was touting the Japanese submarine build, but, of course, it had a sting in its tail. Namely, he wanted to have the submarines built in Japan, not in Adelaide, through mm. the ASC yard here at Techport. Mm. And, of course, uh, our little sub-subgroup, if I can put it to you that way, mm. were actually against that. We wanted to have all the boats that were uh, tendering for the replacement being built out of Techport because we mm. understood right from the get-go that there would be a loss of uh, technology, there would be a loss of personnel, a loss of employment, all the things that actually are the the uh, the go-to and press-button issues of the South Australian public in terms of submarine manufacture. So what we ended up doing through various ways and means was we got Shinzo Abe, the former Japanese prime minister who had tragically been gunned down <clears throat> in, in Japan uh, uh, not that long ago. I think it was about a few months back now. But the uh, the fact is that we got his senior submarine men to come out here and they made a pledge in front of Australian defence industry, which actually rocked the Abbott government. Um, it was really quite amazing. But it rocked the Abbott government because they made the pledge that they, if, if Australia wants to sign off on the Japanese bill, we will build this, uh, the, the Japanese submarines out of Techport. We ended up going with a French bid, and we all know what happened with that. Yeah, but well, fill me in. Why, why did we go with the French as opposed to the Japanese and the German? What was the what was the winning, the decisive thing? It's complicated. When you talk about defence acquisition, Jeremy, there's no straight answer, so just bear with me. Um, I, I think that uh, people or certain factions who were backing the French bid were blown away by what the French were proposing in terms of pump jet technology. And that notion gave us an idea that the next conventional submarine that we would get after Collins wouldn't have spinning propellers at the back, but we'd be able to draw water in from the outside and jet it out the back, mm -hmm. making the boats faster, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and also there was another thing that the French build would allow us. If we ever wanted to go nuclear, mm -hmm. we would be able to, you know, buttonhole the French and say, hey, listen, you know, we'll get our first batch of submarines as conventional boats, but because you're a nuclear power, if we want to have that option sometime down the down the chain, say for the last two or three boats, can we go nuclear? Now, the French would have probably said, yes, you can. And you can leverage off French nuclear industry mm -hmm. to have that. So there were some distinct advantages going French that the Japanese couldn't put on the table and neither could the Germans. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that was really important here is that the, the, the missed opportunity, you know, during that period of time in 2015, uh, well, actually, my colleague, uh, Professor Panendra Jang from the University of Adelaide and myself, we've been working over many years uh, on, 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 a, um, on, on working on the strategic compact between Australia, Japan and the United States. So we started this project off in 2004, basically. And the thing is that as everything developed from a political perspective, we were getting closer and closer to the Japanese. So the Japanese were really, are, and still are, a natural partner for Australia in the Asia Pacific. We are America's northern and southern anchors mm -hmm. in our patch, right? Uh, we have a lot of American equipment. We can 
uh, act, well, in military speak, it's we, we can act in an interoperable fashion. So, you know, we can swap out equipment, we can put our forces, uh, you know, next to Japanese forces and, and uh, leverage off each other's supply lines, which makes the potential for war fighting for both countries so much easier. Mm -hmm. And the Americans, well, you know, we're both under Uncle Sam, so we're not against Uncle Sam no, no, at no, all. No, no, no. But you'd be for this new pact with the, the Japanese, the UK and the US? Uh, uh, we, we, we have, uh, look... It's it's an amazing uh, journey that I can uh, uh, tell you about. But the, the long and the short of it, um, um, Jeremy, is that the French submarine bid uh, failed for the reasons that are very long-winded for me to get and into. And that was a nuclear submarine anyway that they were going to rejig. It, it was it was a, a nuclear submarine design that they were going to rejig. Um, but the, the whole problem really fell apart because... We wanted more Australian content, and for obvious reasons. You know, sure. we're an island continent, very, you know, very far away from France. We can't expect France to just basically, uh, uh, you know, drop in supplies whenever we wanted them to because, you know, that wouldn't be good. So it, it um, helps for us to actually have the capacity to build a boat from the ground up. Yes. It gives us the ability to maintain the boats, uh, deep maintenance in particular. It also gives us an ability that maybe in the future we have enough people that we could design our own boats yeah. over time. And then we're not dependent on international supply chains as much. But the French, of course, you know, they signed off on an agreement saying, yes, you know, 60% Australian content. Yes, we can do that. And that was fine. And then, of course, they started backing away from that and saying, well, Australian industry isn't up to par mm. and we won't, you know, we don't think that we could deliver these uh, submarines to you on time or at least to the Australian government's time schedule uh, based on the fact that the French did not have a belief that we were able to push ahead. Yeah. This was a problem for us. But thinking back to that day with the, the top brass down there at... Uh it was uh, the convention centre, wasn't it? Was it the convention centre? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. I mean, think forward a few years, mm. and now suddenly, mm. out of the blue, because the nuclear option was discussed, yep. but it, uh, clearly not an option for people then, mm. and now this complete backflip, and we are going to have nuclear submarines. What did you think when you heard that uh, the French were out at whatever cost to cancel that contract, and I'm still not familiar with the, the amount of money, but it must have been a huge amount of money to get out of that. Yeah, um, uh, many millions. hundreds. Of, yeah, but many hundreds of millions of dollars. Let's let's be conservative here and say hundreds of millions of dollars, which pretty much adds up to it, at least a billion plus. Okay. Of well, what, 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 what did you think when you heard uh, the the decision just like that? We're going nuclear. Well, I, I you know, in in many ways, I, I had I was in two minds. You know, on the, on the first side of the ledger, I'm, I have always been um, a defender of nuclear energy, and I can see the advantages of bringing nuclear energy into Australia, even in a very limited form for a submarine and not for public use further afield. Nuclear energy is clean. Nuclear energy does give you sustainability of power, mm -hmm. you know, um, and if run correctly, I mean, um, it, it ticks all the boxes. But it's a no-brainer, because if you've got a nuclear submarine, you can stay under the water, yes. you've got a, a, a cruising distance that is far greater than any conventional submarine. And you've got the ability to bug out of wherever you happen to be very quickly, whereas with a nuclear power, uh, with a conventional boat, yeah. that isn't necessarily the case. It doesn't matter how tricky your engine is on a nuclear-powered submarine, uh, 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 no, no, a conventional submarine, it will never equate to the speed that you can get from a nuclear power plant. And this is the uh, distinct advantage. Australia is a continent it's an island but it's a continent mm -hmm. and you know to get from one side of the continent to the other does take a great deal of effort and fuel you know for a conventional boat but for a nuclear powered boat you could sprint from the east coast to the west coast when necessary so there were some distinct tactical advantages and look i've been involved when i was in canberra uh, i was involved with some of the debates in the strategic studies communities suggesting that we should go nuclear but the key to all of this Jeremy, is we're not a nuclear country. You know, back in the day, I remember being a kid watching, you know, the old 
TVs, you know, not the flat screen ones. <laughs> but anyway, you know, back in the day, I, 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 as a kid, I saw all the nuclear protesters go up to Roxby Downs and fly their placards. And then they were protesting about the American base at Pine Gap and same mob, you know, just uh, different They'll flag. be there for climate and they'll be there for yeah. the voice. And yeah, 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 Same, same, same crowd. Yeah. But, but, but what, what uh, had gotten me when I was younger was that this must be so important to the Australian psyche that changing our mind on nuclear would take nothing short of some sort of divine intervention. Yes, yes. and then bang. And, 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 then, and then all of a sudden Scott Morrison comes out and, you know, delivers the bomb basically and says, well, we're going nuclear. And it's like everyone took a deep breath. I did too. I thought, well, this is, this is good, but I'm not convinced that the Australian public is going to run with it, uh, especially since we have still got this... And, I mean, I see it on both sides of politics, so forgive me for making a political statement here, but I, there is this leftist thing, this element, mm -hmm. and you see it in the Liberal Party, you see it in the Labour Party sure, also. Sure, sure. And, you know, they will not move, they will not alter, and they will beat you up where you stand if uh, you raise yeah. the nuclear issue under any circumstance. But is it because they are philosophically against nuclear power or is it that they sort of in the Canberra bubble... Uh, don't have uh, the ability to sniff the, the 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 wind, the court of public opinion, and that we can't we can't go nuclear because they won't like it. Well, we've accepted nuclear submarines, the Virginia class, aren't they? Well, they will be the Virginia class coming in. Um, uh, we can go into a little bit more detail. But we've about accepted that, yeah. that, and I haven't seen any demonstrations or people marching in the street or anything like that. Yeah, because still it's theoretical, and by the time we get the Virginia class submarines in dock, being built out of Adelaide, if, yeah. they, are, if they are going to be built out of Adelaide, yeah, if. which is another problem, mm. right? So if we do get these submarines, I think that you will start seeing uh, the various minorities rally against the boats. At the moment, it's just an idea. Yeah. But the long lead time of this submarine build is so far down the road mm. that what's, what's the protest, you know? Um, yeah. At the moment, there's nothing to protest against because we haven't developed it yet. Now, what do you, th what do you think of Australia's uh, current, well, with all of the sabre rattling going on in the South China Sea and yeah. China positioning itself in the South Pacific with various um, island authorities? Yeah. Uh, our preparedness at the moment, I think what have we got? We've got three surface ships. Mm. I don't know, are any of the Collins-class submarines working? Uh, well, as far as I can understand, there's one that's going to be on operation, definitely. Yeah. Maybe we're at about 1.5 of the six submarines that we can actually field at any one 0. time. 0.5 of a submarine? Does that, that work? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, try I'm trying to uh, tell your audience that there is a problem in terms of manning the current fleet. Yeah, the people, we, yeah I've heard that. I've yeah, heard that. And, and people don't really quite get the fact that, okay, so we're trading in or we're going to get rid of the old Collins class. Now, each Collins class submarine has a crew of 40. And on average, you have three crews per submarine. Yeah. And we can't get the required crews for the smaller boats. Yeah. Now, think about this. The Virginia class, which is what we're going to get, the nuclear-powered Virginia Bigger. class, has a crew of 120. Yeah. Then you times that. And again, you know, the numbers on how many of the Virginia class, well, there's a big question mark of whether or not we're going to get three or five but if I'm a betting man, I'd say three because the Americans are having a very hard time expanding their own submarine capability. And yep. if we know anything about the Americans, and God love them, they're great people, but they will look after themselves first. Only, only to be expected. E exactly right. And the fact that we have let our defence industry slash acquisition process crumble under the weight of inconsistencies over the last... 50 odd years, yeah. you know, the Americans will turn around and say, Well, mate, that's your problem. Yeah, well, we really couldn't <laughs> defend Australia on a sunny Sunday afternoon, could we? Uh, well, not against uh, any conventional threat that was hell bent on conquering Australian land. So if they were going to, you know, the old uh, 1980s thugs and thongs idea where yeah. somewhere in the north of Australia, or no, in the north of Australia, I should say, there was a threat, and that threat was a low tech threat. Right? And they came in numbers and scattered themselves across the north of Australia. Would would our defence forces ever be able to push them back into the sea? Mm. Well, you know, a lot of people said no. And um, and I think that the 1980s vision of that still maintains itself today. 
So we've got uh, we've got manning problems in all our units, operational and non-operational units, mm -hmm. manning problems in the reserves, manning problems in defense industry, manning problems in acquisition and maintenance. And also we have this incredible system in Canberra where with this shrinking defense force personnel base, we're making people do five things or, you know, occupy five jobs mm. at once. Mm. And, uh, and you end up having this, for, for those of you mathematicians out there, like a sine wave that goes up and down over time. So sometimes during a period of, say, 11 years, you get a bunch of really highly committed person, uh, personnel mm -hmm. come in, very competent, and you know, the skill base goes up. They and, retire. of course, those people move on, mm -hmm. retire, you know, and then everything drops down again. So over a period of 11 years, you'll have points at which things come together and points at which things just drop off the perch. Mm. And when it drops off the perch, that's when the taxpayer ends up having to pay the bill for the inconsistencies of government's approach mm. to defence. So all you'd have to do really is to attack Australia at the at the bottom of what one of those... Uh, you've got the crest yep. and you've got the trough. The trough. So yeah. you're speaking... Wait for the yeah. trough Pick and then you get <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Now, that brings me to the... Uh, you, you, you mentioned acquisitions. I... Uh, the, we were talking about the um, helicopter, the mm. Taipan. Yeah. Now, not the first incident. No. Uh, but this last one was uh, uh, terribly tragic. Uh, but uh, I didn't see anyone go in history back a little bit to um, 2008 mm. and the Sea Sprite helicopter. Oh, that was an absolute disaster, Jeremy. Well, <laughs> what, 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 we are buying these things and we are paying, I think it cost, it took 10 years mm. and $1.5 billion to get out of that Sea Sprite thing. Yep. Nobody lost his job. I probably was promoted or kicked upstairs or something. Mm. What is wrong with our purchasing of things? We should be able to see what in other parts of the world is working really well. Mm -hmm. We've got the money. We're prepared to spend the money. Yep. We should be buying the best. Well, that would require having the best trained people to make those kind of decisions. Now, your audience needs to understand that with the Australian Defence Force, we've only recently been getting together and pulling uh, everything together in what they call joint force, joint operations. You know, So this is something that we've been doing for perhaps about 25 years, but we're doing it with a contracting personnel base. So we don't have enough personnel to drag out of the, the combat arms and stick into an acquisition office for the duration necessary to build up corporate memory of what went wrong before. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. you know, over the last, you know, 50 years, say, um, going back to the old sine wave thing, right? So you've got people cycling in, some are good, some are bad, some are not committed, some are even actively hostile toward mm. the acquisition that that is coming in because, you know, mm. uh, defence is not a monolithic block. The services aren't monolithic blocks. Within defence, within the services, there are factions who favour, say, for instance, the high Mars artillery system mm. versus, uh, you know, the need for new armoured personnel carriers, right? So you're going to have factions, people who like or mm. favour certain things over others. Now, if you take a person who had made his career mark or her career mark by fighting against a particular acquisition... And they and you make them an, a project manager. You're expecting that person to have a professional outlook in terms of okay, uh, I may not have liked this particular piece of kit, but I'm going to do the best thing I can. Well, that doesn't happen because we're all human beings. We take the grudges and the old wars that we used to fight, mm -hmm. and we bring it into the new system. And you just drop the ball. Are there any sort of uh, uh, sticky fingerprints of uh, some of these consultants? Over yeah. these decisions, uh, well, I, I'd hate to think that there wouldn't be, because I'm sure there are. The only thing is that we have to be very careful with what we say publicly about these things. We have outsourced and privatized a lot of defence thinking to organisations that are very mercenary in the way that they come across. I mean, they're there to do a job for government. They're not mm. there to look after Australia. Right, mm. that takes patriotism. Mm -hmm. When you're when you're, when you're buying expertise in, it may make financial sense, but you're not necessarily getting the best value for money because those people are not committed to defence. They're only committed to their paycheck. The motivation is different, mm. and this is something that I, I have always been a critic of. 
you know, the, the, the downsizing of critical elements of defence or the outsourcing of them to private enterprise, yes, from a neoliberal financial perspective, one can make the argument, we get more bang for the back, John, you know, that's what we're going to do. Because for years we've been doing everything in-house and it was all higgledy piggledy <laughs> and very expensive. Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter is, what is a defence force, Jeremy? Mm-hmm. It's about committed people committed to the defence of, of Australia, mm-hmm. whether at the high strategic level or at the low tactical level. It makes no difference. If those people are only in it for the money, you're going to have to ask yourself, what are the quality of the people who you have in the system? Why does it take us years and years to do something when you look at the Chinese and they manage to, I think, launch one significant warship a week? Uh, The Chinese. Yeah, well, look, you know, they're they're long-term thinkers and their advantage in long-term thinking, Jeremy, comes from the fact that they're a dictatorship. And they don't have any arguments with anyone. You will do well, this and Well, that's correct. Smart. But, but then the question is, do we want to live in that society? I mean, yes, there are advantages in terms of <clears throat> their defensive capabilities or their defence industries. Someone gives the order, everyone else just, you know, says, sir, yes, sir, and carries that order out. Mm. And then all of a sudden they get one ship per month coming out of their yards. Mm. That's great for them. But then the other thing is, have we, what, what do we know about the quality of their build? You know, that's another thing altogether. The mm. quality of Western manufacture is still superior to anything that comes out of China. Mm. As a matter of fact, if it wasn't for the West's investment in Project China from the moment that Deng Xiaoping opened up that economy to international um, or, or, or foreign investment, I should say, um, then we would be in a very different situation. I mean, uh, China would still be... Uh, a Maoist country struggling mm. with basic issues like starvation. A peasant economy. Yep, yeah, absolutely. I remember going to China. Uh, I was at 2GB at the time, and we took a whole bunch of listeners there. And it was just after Tiananmen Square, which would have been in 80, oh, I don't know. 89. 89, yeah. yeah. And uh, looking at the major cities, at a distance, mm. <laughs> they were absolutely amazing mm. The skyscrapers, yeah. so modern, so Western. Uh, but the hotel that we were staying at, uh, what you say about the build is interesting because I remember clearly going into the room and realising that the walls didn't join. Right. It, from yeah. a distance, yeah. it was just schmick and lovely. But yeah. upon closer examination, mm-hmm. it was clearly that these things were being thrown up at such a rate that there was no quality control, certainly no uh, health and safety rules and regulations. Amazing. The, the faster a country develops, the more lapsadaisical it is in the quality of what they build. It doesn't matter what they build, whether it's a building, whether it's a warship or anything else. Mm. And China is kind of like uh, suffering from a geopolitical elephantitis. You know, they they really want to jumpstart and become the biggest thing in the room. And they want to intimidate all other countries based on that fact alone. Mm -hmm. They have, well, up until recently, the biggest population in the world. They have a massive industrial base. As you rightly point out, they're, you know, churning out naval ships, you know, one after the other, leaving the Americans in the dust. But pound for pound, if you were to take American craftsmanship on an American warship, especially a new build warship, mm. and measure it up against the best that the Chinese have to offer, I would hazard a guess that the Chinese build would be less than capable of holding its own against the Americans, which, again, very few people will think of because when they think of China, they think of this ever-expanding empire. You know, they, they read the headlines and many of the headlines are hyperbole, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And they get carried away with the idea that China is a big threat, China is a big threat. China is a threat to Australia, let's be under no illusion, but it's not the sort of threat that the newspapers make it out to be. And the, the thing that I fear about our understanding of China is that while we're all carried away with warships and planes and mm-hmm. Taiwan and all of this kind of thing, The influence operations that they continue to conduct, the cyber warfare operations they continue to conduct, Mm. we make absolutely no uh, bones about that. That that stays in the shadows. We don't hear about that. But they Mm. are conducting these Mm. things all the time. I mean, crikey, only only recently they were actually bribing local politicians to ensure that their version of the world was going to be put forward. Now, I mean, in a Western democracy, 
where you would kind of think to yourself, that stuff shouldn't happen. We shouldn't let a dictatorship dictate terms to Australia based on the fact that we've got a couple of weak links in our political system. What happened to our intelligence forces or mm-hmm. community, I should say? What happened sh- to the media to try and what, what, ask some of these right, right. pointed questions? Right. Well, I mean, we don't have <clears throat> people in the media asking these pointed questions. No. Um, when you look at, uh, you mentioned Taiwan, and you've got uh, the South China Sea, and you've got the saber rattling in the South Pacific, and you've got Putin invading, and you've got uh, NATO kind of muscling up, shaping up. I mean, is this a more tricky time in the world for quite some time, do you think? Yes. Uh, it's far more chaotic than we're used to. We're used to an American-led order uh, where the Americans were so dominant after the Cold War yeah. that we could just sit back and relax and not think about too much. I mean, at that time, the Chinese were too busy trying to grab what they could out of the West, so they were behaving themselves in order for them to get what they needed. But now they think that they're on top of the world, or at least Xi thinks his country's on top of the world, and so he thinks that China can stand alone against the world, which it is currently doing. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, China has no technical allies outside of North Korea, and North Korea is not a, is not an economic or industrial powerhouse. This is a problem for China. The United States, on the other hand, has a global network of alliances with pretty much all of the rest of international industry and Mm. business and commerce combined, which means that the collective GDP of the West should, by rights, mean that we thump the Chinese in any stouch. Mm. Where Where our problem in the West comes in is that we're not being led well enough to understand our inherent advantages, and we're almost too happy to allow the Chinese to have their time in the sun. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of thinking, well, look, they're incompatible with us on values, on politics, on the way to run society. You know, they are in many ways an enemy state. We shouldn't Mm -hmm. be allowing them to develop at our expense, take Mm -hmm. our technology, rework Mm -hmm. it. Now, where are the people guarding the intellectual property? Where are the people Mm -hmm. guarding our political processes from being... You know, so this this is where I think that the Chinese threat is real and ever present. When it comes to, you know, a stoush between them, uh, you know, between the United States and and, and China militarily, whether it be over China or uh, Taiwan, I should say, or over the South China Sea, I'm I'm not as concerned because I think that the Americans (laughs) will have China's measure. Doesn't mean that, you know, the Chinese won't Mm, mm, won't, won't mm. do damage. It's just that I think that it's a controlled damage, much more controlled than what we'd like to think. Where do you think we are with the doomsday clock? How close to 12 o'clock? Because after the Cold War, it did come back a little bit, and it it must be lurking somewhere like uh, a minute to 12. The doomsday clock brings in a lot of factors. You know, the climate change factor. We just had Professor Ian Plymer here, so I'm sure he has a a view on that. But, I mean, there's, there's that. There's, uh, you know, the the, the, the uh, state of the economy, the state of the world in terms of who's fighting who. Look, um, yes, the clock is getting closer to midnight, but I think that we could wind the clock right back if we had the right people in power in the West who understood the complexities that are going on around us. What should they be doing? What they should be doing is basically pre-selecting the right people for relative, you know, for for the various political parties. But should we be uh, more? Should we have a more aggressive stance, or should we be more keen to uh, conciliate and arbitrate? Yeah, look, um, I would be a hawk on a lot of matters, Jeremy, including this. I, yeah. I think that there are ways in which, for instance, we could confront the Chinese. I mean. How many people in Australia understand that we hold China's future in the palm of our hand? Explain. How how, how do you mean? Right, okay, well, you know, it's Gina Reinhardt's iron ore Uh, that are allow that are allowing the Chinese to grow their you know, their 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 industrial economy, uh, (coughs) grow their military industrial complex. You know, uh, and provide us with a surplus. And, and provide us with a surplus. Now, I know that it would mean that Australia would have to think differently about its own way in the uh, way in the world, economically speaking. But if China was and should be considered a threat of some description, 
then we can't be making money off them at the same time. I mean, we all remember the old story of Pig Iron Bob selling oh, yeah, the scrap yeah, metal yeah, off to yeah, the Japanese, yeah, yeah. and all of a sudden yeah. it was the Mitsubishi bombers built from Australian <laughs> scrap iron that was being dropped off on, mm. on Darwin. I mean, you know, we're repeating history all over again, and yes. we're almost blind to it. We just don't care. And the Japanese were great copyists. They were able they were. to very cleverly uh, copy the best of the West. Yes. And yes. then turn it against us. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, what do we value, uh, Jeremy? Do we value money or do we value ourselves and our livelihoods? Uh, our livelihoods? I mean, are, they pre- are, they, are we prepared to fight and sacrifice to maintain what we have mm. or do we then just curry favour with the next big autocrat that comes along because, you know, they need our stuff and we can make a... A killing on that. It's a bit schizophrenic, isn't it? It is. Yeah, we, we'll we'll have a stance which says that, 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 that this is our, these are our morals, this is our position mm. in the world. And oh, by the way, would you like to do a deal? We've got, have we got a deal for you, Jeremy? This is this is the thing that uh, you know from from a geopolitical perspective, and not being an economist, mm. I have great respect for some, not many for others, because I think that the. You know, the economy is almost like um, the pea and shell game, right? Mm. And, I mean, if you talk to an economist about, well, how real are the Chinese <laughs> figures? Oh, they, you know, we have to base everything on, you know, whatever China puts out. And so we'll, we'll, we'll have these nice glossy reports telling you about, you know, their economic activities and just what a breakneck speed they're going. And then you, you question them and say, well, you know, at what point do you think it's a dictatorship and they will try to fudge the numbers to make it appear that they're far stronger mm. than they actually are? I oh, don't want to hear any backbiting from mm. the, 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 econo- the economists will always make an argument that even though the Chinese figures may be doctored, they are at some point close to the truth and they give us a metric by which we can measure Chinese economic success mm. based on <laughs> what? Lies? <laughs> Could be. Right. Propaganda. Right. (laughs) Okay. So these are the things that we really need to confront at some level because a lot of our national policy at the moment is trying to repair the damage with the Chinese that we sustained through COVID prior to, uh, well, actually, uh, before COVID, back in 2018 even, when uh, Donald Trump started getting China's measure and then starting to, you know, he started to do some things in terms of um, um, uh, trade embargoes, yeah. But do you think it's possible to have the sort of relationship with China that says, well, look, you can come and buy here Mm -hmm. because I don't know what exactly in terms of dollar value the Chinese own in Australia, but I would suggest in just in real estate, it's a great deal. I think it is. Okay, so you can come and do that and we'll be the best of neighbours, but we want the same right to go to China and buy land there, which, of course, you can't do. No. There's not even the hint of reciprocity. Nope. <laughs> nope. And, and we cop that. Yes, we do. But because we don't we... want to... Because the, the, when the Chinese come in and they pay top dollar mm. for a really nice house and, in fact, drive the value of that house up considerably because of the supply and demand thing, mm-hmm. that's improving our quality of life. We'll have principles, but you're not going to affect my bank account. Negatively. And and the other thing that I've also noticed here from a political perspective, when there are hard and complex issues, namely the ones that we're just talking about, we tend to want to outsource all that thinking to the United States anyway, you know, or or someone else. We don't want to actually sit down and do the work necessary to figure out an Australian solution for these very Australian problems. Or the other thing that we do is just kick the can down the road. Look at what the Albanese government is doing at the moment. Penny Wong is busily trying to make entreaties to China to, you know, repair the damage economically and various other... And, and look, that's that's our solution to everything. So we're going to do exactly what we did before. You know, on the one hand, there are people in Australia now who've woken up to the fact that maybe, you know, putting all our eggs in the China basket was never a good thing. But now we're putting all our eggs back in the China basket. And I'm <laughs> wondering, well... What have what, we learned? What have we learned? <laughs> what have we learned? That, you know, we don't learn from our History. defence acquisition mistakes. No. We're not learning from our geopolitical mistakes, more no. generally. No. Do you see... What do you see in the future? Do you see uh, Australia becoming another state of the United States? Or do you see Australia being part of a United States of Asia? Wow, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And it's a question I've been struggling with um, over the last two weeks, weirdly enough. 
you know, I, I kind of think that Australia's fate isn't as a state of the United States, but certainly mm. a dependency. Somewhere along the lines of the Marshall Islands or Guam, mm. mm-hmm. you know, will be Firebase Australia. So the Americans will be able to put their military forces here and use us as a base of operations in the Indo-Pacific. Nice big aircraft carrier. Nice big aircraft carrier for the United States. And really, hmm. what do we gain out of that? Okay, so we shelter under the American umbrella. But there's, not, there's, there's, a, there's a problem with that whole notion, and that is, at what point are we ever going to be a sovereign country? Hmm. Because under those kind of conditions, we have literally given the United States our sovereignty. Yes. We can't operate at a military level by ourselves. So if there was something closer to home, like the Solomon Islands yeah, or yeah, Papua yeah, New Guinea, yeah, yeah. we would have to go through Washington to get their permission to prob- probably land American forces where we need them to be rather yeah. than Australia. What happened to, you know, NATO yeah. uh, was established, and I think somewhere a little bit later on, there was this thing called CETO, which was the Southeast Asian Treaty, Treaty Organization. Organization. Yeah. I never hear anybody talking about that at all now. Yeah, well, that's uh, that and CENTO, the Central uh, East Asian. Uh, anyway, CENTO, for, forgive me, I, these are terms that I was very well acquainted with. But CETO, until, uh, yeah. to ask somebody in the street, uh, what, do you, what do you think of CETO? Say, what? What's that? What's well, that? Well, that's right. But we all know what NATO is. Well, we do, because CETO and CENTO were... Uh, elements built up for American power being projected in Southeast Asia and the the sort of South Asia area, you know, India, Pakistan, all that kind of, um, all all those countries. Now, the fact of the matter is that the Cold War is no longer with us, but CETO and CENTO died during the Cold War as organisations rallying uh, Mm. countries together, diverse countries together as well, actually Mm. mutually antagonistic countries together. The only thing that they had in common was that they had reasonably good relationships with the United States mm. because they bought American weapons. But that was really the only thing holding CETO, for instance, together. Um, they've been subsequently superseded by other organisations like for Southeast Asia, we have the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, mm. Mm. Uh, ASEAN. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, we have various other economic things. This I, I can never say this, so forgive me, everyone. The CTPT, uh, whatever, uh, the Comprehensive Treaty for... <laughs> I can't say it. It's, just, it's one of those economic <laughs> terms where the economies of the Indo-Pacific come together mm. in some form to allow for better free trade. Why right? couldn't we? Why couldn't we be kind of like Singapore, or only on steroids? You look at that little tiny, yeah. little tiny island. Yeah. Uh, it's it's wealth, it's uh, quality of life, yeah. quality of education. It's a hub. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's everything that we could be. I mean, we need a, a Lee Kuan Yew. That's the only problem. Australia is a federation, and I agree with you. I mean, I think that, look, you know, Australia should have better political leadership. Lee Kuan Yew was a great leader. He was indeed. But he was also a little bit autocratic, He was say. an autocrat. He, I, yeah. I, I, I interviewed him, and he, uh, uh, he explained that he had been a, uh, a jungle fighter, yep. a communist, mm-hmm. He had been a socialist and uh, a capitalist, yep. and then he finally decided that he was a nationalist. Yep. Everything was for the nation of Singapore. Mm-hmm. And but he ran the entire political gamut from yes. ex- to one extreme to the other. But what a leader, and people respected him. He, uh, yes, uh, but again, Singapore and Australia, from a political perspective are two very different entities. I mean, Singapore is a small, a tiny island state. They'll tell you it's a police state, but yeah. I tell you what, going there, you would never feel more safe anywhere Oh, I agree. I love world. Singapore. Absolutely love it. Um, and, and still do when I do travel. I yeah. always make sure that I, I have a, a day or two in Singapore on the way to the Middle East and back, you know, yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. a nice layover place. And it is. It's clean. It's lovely. You know, the food is excellent. There are things to see. You know, it has everything. But it is a tiny speck on a map. Mm. Australia is blessed by a different sort of geography, which means that we are a federal structure. And being a federal structure, we have a massive territory to administer. Now, how strong do you want Canberra's powers to be when sometimes the bubble of Canberra will make decisions that could impact, say, Tasmanians negatively or mm-hmm. South Australians mm-hmm. negatively? Right? Certainly so, somebody. Yeah, well, somebody. So, so what we're looking for in a prime minister who's effective and efficient isn't a dictator, but more like a conductor. 
So if you can, you know, think, all right, well, we're a federation, everyone's got their own particular local issues that need to be fixed, and, and that's fair and reasonable. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the interests of South Australia do not necessarily reflect those of Western Australia or the Northern Territory. The Prime Minister of this country, whether Liberal or Labor, need to understand this mm. and need to be able to bring in cooperation as a conductor of an orchestra, manages to bring in the various mm. instruments to have a harmonious sound at the end. You make it sound beautiful. but It, it, it could be. It could be, yeah. Harmony. 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 It's, what it's, a lovely it's about, thought. It's about harmonisation rather than force because Canberra will never be able to force you um, unless you actually wipe out the government structures as they are currently conceived of. <sighs> but if you were to actually have a person that understood the harmonious nature, roll with the punches, you might be able to get something through. Yeah. Here we talk about uh, and all of the money that gets put into uh, trying to muscle up and be uh, 21st century in our defence capabilities because mm -hmm. if you look like you can defend yourself, chances are you won't have to. Mm -hmm. But it worries me. I sit here in front of uh, uh, little Tiny and, and Andy's genius and uh, Tony Denton's genius who built all of this. Uh, it's just a tiny, neat package which technology has delivered as a radio station on a dining room table that it would uh, take a whole building full of stuff and then another building with a transmitter in it and all that sort of business. And here we are worrying about submarines and helicopters and uh, uh, surface ships and whatnot when somebody can sit in a basement in Peking or uh, Beijing with a computer and through cyber mm -hmm. technology, cyber espionage, stop all the banking in America or stop all the traffic lights or just completely disrupt society mm -hmm. because it's all so interrelated. You wouldn't have to interfere with too many things to have complete, absolute Paralysis yep. and chaos. Maybe we should be trying to find these young kids who are in basements in various places, maybe in, if we're lucky in higher places of higher learning, and we get them into some sort of army mm. to protect. Because I'm sure if somebody can have something that is offensive, we can have something that is defensive. Would, would I be right or wrong in saying that? Or is there no defence against a cyber invasion of one kind or another? You're, you're, you're right, and dare I say there is a problem with that form of thinking. And the problem is something that we've touched upon before. Where are the motivations for people to step up to do that kind of thing? If we can't put people in uniform to defend the country at a physical, more traditional level, where are you going to get your cyber army from? For Andy, 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 can you come up with something? Yeah. I'm, I'm dead ten guys there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to uh, train them up. You've got to make sure they're loyal. So that requires background checks, which requires a very um, slow-moving um, intelligence bureaucracy that sits over this, that you're not going to get your double agents who will put their hand up for recruitment and be, you know, playing both sides off each other, maybe for a brown mm -hmm. paper bag of money. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a lot of things that you have to consider on, on, that, on that level. I think, yes, you could probably do something about trying to get more people into the system, but here I think we need to revisit mm. something like national service. I mean, I think that there's no, there, there is no, it's the yeah, ugly why answer. Not? Why not? Why well, not? It, why not? Uh, Jeremy, you'll have the uh, the old salt soldiers who will say, ah, oh, no, professional armies, me, because, you know, we need, you can't, you can't get quality if you don't have a professional army. And if you've got conscripts, you're know, always having to train them uh, and they're not going to be as good as a professional soldier. And, and look, they have a point. 
But at the same time, there are many countries that manage to have a hybridised army of both professionals on the one side and yes, conscripts yes. on the other. Well, Singapore for one. All right, right. And, and Israel. Right. And uh, I don't know if they're still drafting people in America. I suppose they uh, are. Uh, no, not in America. Uh, they've gone for an all-volunteer force structure after the Vietnam War. Mm. But the thing is that we could think outside the box and we could try to, you know package this thing up in a way that the Australian people would understand the benefits of doing this. I mean, crikey, we get focus groups for the most mundane and stupid things. Mm. Why can't we get a a focus group together to figure out whether or not a national service that could incorporate, you know, the cyber hacker element it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you have to stand, uh, you know, in nor- on northern Australian shores with a rifle in your hand. It could mean a bunch of other things. You, yeah. you want to be a, a, you know, a green mm. tree hugger, then, you know, your national service for 18 months, you're planting trees. Yeah, we could turn something. it around and you could say, well, you know? on one hand, you've got national service, but on the other hand, we simply call it service to the nation. Well, that's that's another thing too. I mean, what's in a word? Everything's yeah, in a word. But you know what they do in Singapore, don't you? Without sort of boring you with Singapore, I'm a fan of Singapore. But uh, if you come out of school mm. and you have a job, mm. you do, I think it's three months national service. If you come out of school and you don't have a job, mm. you do five years or three years of national service. Consequently, people come out of school with a job. Yeah, it's a no-brainer, really. Yeah. Or if they if they uh, defer to go to university, yeah. they have to go through the same thing at the end of their university course. It's yeah. National service, yeah. or it's a job. Well, you know, here in Australia, we've got an infinitely better system. You come out of school, you go straight on to Centrelink. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. A- absolutely flawless, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's brilliant, <laughs> brilliantly conceived. I, I tell you, John, I always <laughs> always enjoy talking to you. Thank you for thanks, Jeremy, coming out and it's been a pleasure sitting around the table. Thank you. I really do appreciate it. Uh, are you talking anywhere or writing a book or anything of uh, late? I've got a book. Uh, I'm trying to republish a book that I had put together initially back in 2002 on defence acquisition, Australian defence acquisition. And, you know, I'm probably a quarter of the way through the rewrite, but I keep on getting <laughs> disturbed by other things, namely children on the one side and various other commitments on the other. So, I mean, whether I get this this passion project up and running is anyone's guess at this point in time. <laughs> Good to see you, John. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Dr. John.